UPCM Med Choir for the opening song, Yuki Naming Mahal. So good afternoon, uh, dear students, esteemed faculty, uh, the dean, and uh, everyone who's uh, joining us via our YouTube live. So uh, I am Dr. Tofer Constantino from the UPCM Department of Anatomy, and I'd like to welcome all of you to our uh, wellness webinar. It's the first webinar organized by the uh, wellness champions of the uh, UP College of Medicine. So we are all lucky that the college has made this as a response to the challenging times brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. So to start our program, uh, I'd like to call on uh, Sir Nigel Tan from uh, the Mental Health Committee Head of Class 2024 for our invocation. But uh, before that, I'd like to um, request for a moment of silence for uh, our beloved uh, faculty, Dr. Joey Avila, who recently passed away, and as well as um, all of our uh, other loved ones and uh, who have uh, fallen due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's uh, offer this uh, short moment of silence. Okay, uh, Sir Nigel. If you wish, sure. if you will, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, so may we invite everyone to a moment of silence um, as we reflect on our experiences these past few months and unite ourselves with our Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, continue to guide us as we walk in this path of service and self-denial of fulfillment and growth. We continue to pray for our safety and well-being in these difficult times especially for the faculty and interns who continue to tirelessly serve. We pray for those afflicted by this COVID-19 virus and by the different forms of poverty that have become so evident today, from the lack of stability and sustenance to the lack of compassion and understanding within our communities and even our own homes. May our pleas be answered and may help come our way. We offer to you all our concerns, all the things that weigh heavily in our hearts as we ask for your guidance and mercy. Also, Lord, we pray for our medical students as we continue to strive and enable ourselves as future physicians. We thank you for the break that has passed, which has allowed us to rest our minds and bodies. We also thank those who have made this possible. As we continue to drive ourselves to learn and to perform, may we be reminded to practice self-care. 
and to recognize our physical and emotional limitations. Imbibe in us a sense of gratitude for the little things, whether that be a warm meal or a kind gesture. Allow us to be ever kinder to ourselves, to accept that which we cannot change, and to forgive even when reason is against it. Also that we may adapt together in these changing times. We thank you for this opportunity to learn more about the value of spirituality as an integral part of our well-being. We thank you for those who have made this wonderful event possible, as well as the faculty and students here with us today. We also pray for Father Gaston, that you may always guide him as an instrument of your divine love. Lord, may you grant us this open space to learn from each other and to engage and to re-engage with our purpose. As we begin, may we take this opportunity to become more in touch with ourselves and with our wider world. Amen. All right. Thank you, Nigel, for that uh, prayer. So now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our Dean, Dr. Charlotte Chong, to give uh, welcoming remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Toffer, and of course, Nigel. I'm really very uh, pleased to be with you all today joining as a community. I would like to thank the UPC MPGH Wellness Committee for organizing this. I think um, all of us will agree that um, it's very important that we try to offer our burdens to the Lord. And for this, I'd like to thank also uh, Father Gregory Ramon Gaston, who despite the fact that he only spent two years with the UP College of Medicine as a member of UPCM class 1990, continue to nurture us with his prayers and continue to be with us. And uh, I'd like to thank him in advance for sparing the time for to be with us this afternoon. Our college has been beset with a lot of problems. Our families have been affected. Our faculty have become fallen heroes. Nobody can underestimate the impact of this pandemic in our individual lives and also its impact on our community. A lot of people are now despairing, um, becoming hopeless because they don't know how our country will be able to survive this either economically or whether our population will be decimated by this, um, by this virus because of the very slow rollout of the vaccines and the so many myriad of problems that we now face. I'm really hats off to our students who continue to study and get by with their virtual medical education. I salute all the faculty who have sacrificed their time and in the face of shifting to remote learning have given off so much of themselves just to be able to deliver the education for future doctors of our country. As your dean, I am really praying that we can be united. I know that it's very difficult to do that when we are all in our respective homes, but I am really faithful to the Lord with this compassion that he will sustain us and that his faithfulness will be unburden us. I'm, every day I, I thank the Lord for waking up in the morning knowing that I'm still alive because, for example, for Dr. Avila, I was just actually texting him uh, the day before, the, the afternoon before he had a stroke, when in fact he was telling me that he was already recovering and he promised to read my slides uh, this week. So life is very fleeting and we all know that. But with the Lord's grace, we can all survive this and we can rest in the knowledge that he is always with us. And I hope that this afternoon's gathering will be another testament to, uh, to this faithfulness, to our belief that God will always be here with us. Maraming maraming salamat sa pagdalo ninyong lahat at lalo na sa nag-organas nito at lalo na kay Father Gaston dahil uh, narinito siya with us today to, to guide us and to lead us. Maraming maraming salamat po.
Right, thank you so much po, Dean, uh, Dean Charlotte Chong. So, uh, yes, thank you for that encouraging message. Uh, indeed, no, uh, it has been very challenging po uh, ngayong COVID. But uh, as you have said, uh, it's better, it's good that we have these avenues so that uh, despite the challenges we face, we still look forward to uh, positivity around us. No? So this is one. So uh, to introduce our uh, esteemed uh, speaker, I'd like to call on Dr. Rowena Henuino from the Department of Anatomy and Dermatology to introduce our speaker for today. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, Father Gregory Gaston is a priest of the Archdiocese of Manila and currently rector of the Pontificio Colegio Filipino in Rome. Born in 1965 in Negros Occidental, he um, attended high school at the Philippine Science High School and then went, went on to be at zoology at the UP Las Banas. And finally, he spent two years at the UP College of Medicine in my class, the UPCM class of 1990. And that's where he discovered the, his uh, vocation. He was sent to the University of Navarre in Spain for seminar, seminary formation and he finished his bachelor's in philosophy and bachelor's in theology. He also went to the St. Thomas University in Rome for further studies, finishing a licentiate and doctorate in sacred theology. He also finished a fellowship in the National Catholic Bioethics Center in Boston, and he continued to serve in seminaries, parishes, media outfits, and bioethics committees in Manila and abroad. In 2017, he was given by the UP Alumni Association in America the Distinguished Alumni Award for Leadership and Service. He has been our um, speaker for the past four years for our Lenten and Advent webinars that are organized by uh, my class, the UPCM Class 99. So without further ado, let us welcome my classmate, and our spiritual guide for this afternoon and always, Father Gregory Ramon Picastan. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Inuino, for that introduction. So just a few points before Dr. Gas uh, Father Gaston starts his talk, no? some house rules for the participants. So number one, uh, everyone, please turn off your videos and microphones at all times, uh, unless uh, you are called by the moderator later during our question and uh, answer portion. For questions or comments uh, you would like to raise, kindly use the raise hand function later during our Q&A portion or type your concerns in the chat box. Please wait to be acknowledged by the moderator and introduce yourself by giving your name and learning unit or department. For those uh, with us in uh, YouTube, you can type your questions there in the chat box in YouTube. For those watching from private stream, uh, yun nga, sa questions na lang po. And then when speaking, please try to be as clear and concise as possible. And then uh, another thing, no, if you want to eliminate the sound uh, produced by everyone uh, joining and leaving, you can find it in the more tab found in the participants tab of the chat. All right. So without further ado, uh, Sir Ferdi, we can start with the talk. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to give this little reflection on nurturing the spirit amidst the pandemic. We have three objectives. First, to explore how spirituality can help medical students and members of the academy to cope better given the new learning mode and setting during this pandemic. Second, to encourage students to reflect on their spirituality and find a deeper sense of purpose and meaning in life. And third, to provide ways and strategies to nurture one's spirituality aligned with promoting well-being and preventing burnout. So this will be a little reflection that is both on the theoretical level and also in the practical level. But before going into these objectives, I would like to review the word spirit itself. We talk about the spiritual. So what is spirit? It has its root 
in spiritus in Latin, which means breath or the spirit. The verb is to breathe, spirare. It also refers in a certain way, of course, to volatile substances, distillates, no? so spirits, the liquors, the, uh, like the brandies and uh, this other uh, hard liquor, they are also called spirits. And in a certain way, it is because they give some breath, no? they give some life when somebody takes those volatile substances. The spirit is that which allows us to breathe and thus also to live. So when we are breathing, it means that we are still alive. The word respiration also comes from the word Latin word spirare, re spirare, meaning to breathe again. And when we respire, we continuously breathe and breathe again. And that means that this breathing, this action gives life to a living being. Another term is inspiration. So breathe into. So in English, we say that we are inspired if we give life to an idea. So we have an idea, it gives, it has life, then it is because we are inspired. And also the opposite, expired, no? so expiration, which means that there is no more life in the same way that in, into, uh, into life, X is outside or going out of life and there is no more life. So then we now go to the first objective to explore how spirituality can help medical students and members of the academe cope better given the new learning mode and setting during this pandemic. And we could also apply this to other fields, not only medicine, but also nursing and all the allied fields as well. Let us take some considerations on the reality of the spiritual. What is the spiritual? What does it mean for something to be spiritual? Indeed, in different cultures and philosophies all over the world. So it is not only the Christian religion, the Catholic Church, or the Muslims, or the Jews, or the Hindus you know, that have a, a spirituality. But even in cultures, in philosophy, people who are not really believers in a certain religion, maybe they could have their idea of what is spiritual. And if you look at the cultures, even way before the big religions that we have now, today, th these cultures always had some form of spirituality. They even had worship of spirits, or they even considered their ancestors no, as becoming spirits. In theology, of course, we discuss a lot no, about God, about the angels, about uh, the spirits, about the soul. So another added um, reflection to this reality of the spiritual, which is there even prior to reflections by the great minds, by the great authors, by the saints. So even prior to that, there was already a consideration of spiritual and theology would simply organize a little more uh, this knowledge or these reflections. And the spiritual also is a reality in individuals. So it's not simply in big cultures, no? it's not simply in the academe, it's not simply in the reflection of other people, but we ourselves, no? you and I, surely experience something beyond what is bodily, something that is beyond the mind, the mental. No? But we, and these things uh, that we sometimes, no, we cannot really even make concrete or we cannot even touch, no? we cannot even sense, but inside of us, no? maybe without our five senses, without using them, but we realize that there is something, something that is spiritual, something that is beyond you know, what we can sense using our five senses. And so 
we could conclude no, seeing all these realities of the spiritual in different levels in the world, in culture, in scientific reflection even, and in individuals, we could say that spirituality is indeed part of human nature. It is part of human nature as individuals, as a community. As they say, no man is an island, so we are all gathered together always as a community. And we cannot even exist no, by ourselves individually. We need other people. And when we say human nature, it includes not only my personal individual uh, nature, but also my human nature of being with other people, of having to be with other people. And there also spirituality would come in. And therefore, since spirituality is part of human nature, doing away with spirituality is like amputating our culture, our society, and our very selves. Since it is part of human nature, removing, taking away, or even forgetting once in a while, the spiritual aspect would mean to sort of limit ourselves, no, not, not arriving or not trying to arrive at our fullness as human beings, as human persons, again, individually and in the community. And if we look at the extreme, if we remove spirituality, there we will see the difference between a body and a corpse and a cadaver. And so a body is something that is alive because it has spirit, yeah, spirare, to breathe, it breathes, and a corpse, on the other hand, is without this uh, spiritual, without this living component. So maybe when we say materially, they might be exactly the same. Uh, a recently deceased person, body, a, a corpse, uh, maybe that is still warm, that maybe so the, the, org, the cells are still alive. Uh, but what is the difference between the two? One has a spirit and one does not have a spirit. One remains only material and maybe the chemical reactions will still continue. But until when? Until maybe they, these, these processes no, would die down or maybe some of the atoms, some of the molecules would be consumed or transformed into another state and it would not revert no, to, to its prior state or it will not continue into a state that would still be functional. And so that is the difference between a living organism body and a dead body without the spirit. So even in animals, not only in humans, but also in animals, we could say that they have a soul. They have a soul. But in theology, we say that, yes, they have a soul, but when they die, the soul also dies with them because that organizing component, that life-giving component also dies with them. Unlike us human beings, at least in theology, this is what we reflect on, we continue. We continue and that is why we still have a lot of, we could find a lot of meaning even beyond our bodily life. After our death, we still could find meaning and that is why we pray for the dead. We continue to relate with them in a certain way and we have this hope to be with them after we die as well and the word anima animals we say no animals uh, they have souls but again the the souls die after they die so but focusing on the term animal animal no, comes from the root anima which is soul in Spanish, it is alma, alma, anima, uh, and there we can find so many other words, no? animal, animate, reanimate, no? etc. And so when we say that we are spirit-filled, no? we are spirit-filled, that means that we are alive, very much alive. No? When, we are, when our spirit fills our whole existence. So to be spiritual also means to be alive. And now, 
the situation is changing since last year with this pandemic and we need to cope. And when we say, I need to cope, what do I refer to? Okay, we do so many new practices that before we have taken for granted, although they were also good even before, before the pandemic, na, as maintaining social distance. When we see a sick person, we maintain a certain distance from that sick person as much as possible, even before the pandemic. But with the pandemic, this has been highlighted and we remember it all the time. Social distancing, wearing masks, no, I think in Japan, even before the pandemic, they were uh, used to wearing masks out of maybe courtesy for other people and of course also out of the health considerations. And hand washing and limited travel, new situation, new realities, and we need to cope with this, not only through the practices, but even in our minds, no, how how do we cope? Each one would have his or her own way. But the fact is, yes, we need to do something. No, We need to adjust. We need to cope. This pandemic has affected individuals, communities, countries, new policies coming up in governments, in the private sector, in the churches, in schools, in offices, in hospitals. So the situation is changing and we are trying to cope through these new practices or old practices that are being highlighted nowadays. And we could also say that strengthening our spirituality is part of building ourselves. And this is part of coping. How can we cope? So many new practices, but also one way is to build ourselves and to strengthen ourselves against all these difficulties, against all this uh, crisis, and we could see some people are able to cope better, other people maybe a little less, and we have to help so many people. Strengthening our spirituality to build ourselves. Yes, we can strengthen the mind, for example, through academic exercises, studying, reading, and so on. We strengthen the body through physical exercises, okay, so gymnasium or running or playing sports, and we strengthen the spirit through spiritual exercises. Okay, so it's not only our mind and our body, I would say especially in this time of pandemic, you know, so many people uh, suffering, so many people having difficulties all over the world, not only in the Philippines, also here in Italy, uh, a lot of cases, a lot of uh, difficulties. We cannot even travel uh, outside our region. No? So, so many, so many, uh, you, have, you have to have reasons no? to travel and it is not so easy. But yes, some people are able to cope. Other people maybe have a little more difficulty and we see news, no? sad news of people uh, maybe going into depression or even worse, no? maybe taking their lives or maybe hurting other people simply because they cannot cope, simply because of this difficulty that we are all experiencing. So in our next objective to encourage students to reflect on their spirituality and find a deeper sense of purpose and, and meaning in life. So in the first objective, we tried to see what the meaning of being spiritual is to help ourselves, strengthen ourselves, build ourselves so that we could cope better with this difficult situation. And maybe in the second objective, we could try to see on how we could reflect. We could reflect further on our spirituality and find a deeper sense of purpose in what we are doing. We are doing so many things, we are so busy, you know, we, are, we, are, we don't have time, you know, we, we have to stay up late at night to study, maybe to finish some tasks, some papers, you know, but well, sometimes we, we have to ask ourselves, you know, we have to pause for a while and ask ourselves for the meaning of all this that we are doing.
oftentimes we are so happy, but sometimes you know, we, we doubt. You know, sometimes we also have to think a lot about what we are doing. Going back a little, I'm trying to see the role of science. I would like to focus on this uh, in these few slides. Also to have a more complete picture. We have been trained as scientists. We have been trained to analyze everything, to examine. We have been trained to test uh, so many things, uh, come up with conclusions, come up with generalizations. And sometimes we think that science could explain everything and that we no longer need anything beyond science. We do not need spirituality because it is not scientific, as some people would say. No? But actually, I think if we focus uh, science a little better, maybe we could find that science is indeed something, yes, something that we have to, to really value. But at the same time, we know that science is not everything. There is something beyond science. It attempts to explain reality and processes. And so that is what science does. Why does the apple fall, for example? So uh, Galileo came up with this uh, law of gravity and then all these other scientific explanations, Einstein, etc. They try to attempt, they attempt to explain reality and the reality of gravity and the processes. But, for example, uh, the Big Bang, okay, yes, again, we go back to the reality, the reality of the Big Bang, a tiny, tiny mass concentrated that had an initial uh, explosion, uh, the Big Bang, and then the universe, even today, continues to expand. And then later on, it will contract and maybe go back no, to that state of a tiny speck of concentrated mass and energy. Okay, so Big Bang Theory, it attempts to explain reality and the processes in that uh, expansion of the universe and in its coming back, no, compression, uh, back to its original state in taking millions, billions, trillions of years in the process. However, Science does not explain the source of reality. Okay, so even though the Big Bang would say that there was a tiny mass, concentrated mass, energy, but it does not try to explain and it cannot explain where that tiny mass came from. Okay, what is the source of that reality? Okay, assuming that the Big Bang is still a theory, but assuming that it is correct, then where did the, the tiny little uh, speck of mass and concentrated energy come from? Okay, so the Big Bang could not, uh, science could no longer explain the source of reality. And also science does not explain the finality or the end purpose. You know, how come there is a Big Bang? How come there is you know, the universe? How come there is a law of physics and gravity? What would be the end? Yes, for the apple to fall, but so what? <laughs> so what happens after, after? And that there we see that science is, yes, is an attempt to explain so many things, but it is a bit limited. And even our human mind, you know, we say that man is the most intelligent animal. Yes, maybe in this world, we don't know if there are other animals, other worlds out there in the universe. But we see, uh, we, we can easily see that the human mind is not perfect. The human mind is not, uh, cannot do everything. The fact that we discover, yes, we discover computers, microchips, etc. But the fact that we discover something means that prior to discovering something, we did not know that. We, we did not know the chips before somebody discovered the chips. It means that we are limited. And the fact, again, the fact that we discover something means that we are limited now and we have to discover something. We will realize something later on because we don't know it right now.
So we are limited right now. The fact that we forget, the fact that we commit errors, only show that that we are indeed, the human mind indeed is quite limited. So science, yes, is excellent. It can do so many things. It can uh, help us even in the face of this pandemic. It can do so many wonders. But again, we cannot say that science can do everything. So we have to try to see other things aside from science. So spirituality helps us go, uh, precisely helps us go beyond science, what science can offer. Now, historically, sometimes there were conflicts between science and religion, uh, materiality, materialism, and spirituality. Uh, some people would say that there is a conflict. However, we can say that both science and religion aim to discover the truth. Now, both of them want to discover the truth and propose the truth. And the truth can only have one source. There's only one creator, and that creator is also the source, not only of being, but also of the truth. And therefore, this creator of the world cannot say one thing in science. Okay, in science, okay, this is the truth. And say another thing in religion. Okay, that is the truth in science, but in religion, the truth is different. Okay, so that would be impossible because there is only one source of truth, and therefore, the truth in science and in religion should not be conflicting. And if ever they might seem conflicting, it only means one thing not that science and religion are incompatible. Okay? No, it is not. It is not the uh, right conclusion. Rather, if some, if there is some seeming contradiction between science and religion, it means that we, that I need to study science a little more, and I need to study religion a little more, okay? because any seeming contradiction is only because of I committed mistake somewhere in my analysis. It's not that science will has a truth. And religion also has a different truth, conflicting, in conflict with each other. Rather, the truth that is proposed by science and religion have to be the same. And if I think that they are not the same, the problem is not with science, the problem is not with religion, but the problem is maybe with me. Maybe I did not study enough, so now I have to study a little more, both science and religion. So, going back no, to the idea that science is not everything, the purpose and meaning in our life, in what we do, in what we study, in what we try to obtain, goes way beyond what is technical, what is offered no, by the practical sciences or even by the even theoretical at the theoretical level, no, which is always brought down to the to the practical. So, for example, we may create a machine, but we can always ask, no, why? Why did I create that machine? What is it for? You know, will it help me? Will will it help somebody? And so what? You know, if it will help, why should it help me? Why should it help another person? So there is a never-ending question. Oh, why, why, why? And this is where we look for purpose. We look for meaning. When as soon as we ask why, what for, we are actually asking for the meaning. How come I am doing this? And we have so many other questions. When we do something, when we aim for something, did I make the right choice? Why did I choose this and not this other? Or maybe I should have studied something else. I should have done something else in life. And this could be parenthesis. Maybe the psychologists, psychiatrists among you would know a little more. You know, what they call the midlife, midlife crisis. The midlife crisis. You know, when somebody reaches maybe late 30s, 40s, you know, midlife and enters into all these different 
doubts, all these different questions about one's life, about one's decisions, and this could take place even earlier, even maybe when one is in his or her 20s no, or 30s, or maybe it could come later in the 50s, 60s, and they say this is part of a normal process in life no, to ask all these questions, and if we are unable to to be satisfied with our own answers, and maybe that is when the difficulty, the crisis, depression, etc. would come in. And that is why the purpose and meaning that we give to what we are doing, to what we want to do, what we are aiming for, these are things that I don't know if they would fall under the sciences, no? but maybe beyond no? the sciences. The sciences would tell us how to do this, how to operate, how to give the medicine, how to formulate, etc. But again, the meaning, uh, the purpose that we ask ourselves, that we try to realize, we try to come up with uh, these answers, maybe they go beyond what the technical, what the sciences could offer to us. And we have to go beyond. Answers could seem clear sometimes and sometimes not. But again, the point is reflecting on them, reflecting on the purpose and meaning of the events, uh, of their impact on us. Okay, so we have the COVID, we have the vaccines, we have the uh, other uh, substitutes, uh, medicines, we have patients, we have healthcare workers dying, exposed to the virus, some getting well, some uh, maybe in a more serious situation. So, so many things going on in this world today, not only the virus, of course, no, but a lot of inequality, a lot of injustice, a lot of suffering, natural disasters, etc. So if we are, we simply look at them at from the scientific perspective, how do I stop a typhoon? I am unable to stop a typhoon, an, er an earthquake. I am unable to stop the virus, a very tiny, tiny particle uh, that, that has changed the whole world. Uh, so science is unable to give solutions and unable to give meaning to all this. Because that is, the, that is not the role of science, to give meaning. As I said in the beginning, it can explain the processes, it can explain what is going on, okay, but it cannot explain the origins and the beginning of all this and the end, okay, the end, which is uh, some, somewhat similar to the meaning. Uh, what is the meaning of my life or what I'm, I am doing? Okay, what I am actually asking where I would like to lead my life to. So when, if, when I ask for the meaning of my life, I am actually asking where I am heading to. What, why, I, why am I doing this? For what end? What is my goal in this life? And again, science would be unable to answer that. Something that is so uh, necessary for us to know, or at least to to reflect on. Sometimes we will not find a clear solution, a clear answer to the question of meaning in our life, but at least we have to reflect on them. So now we go to the third objective to provide ways and strategies. Okay, so this, why, this time a little more practical to nurture one's spirituality aligned with promoting well-being and preventing burnout. So going back to our question, to our topic itself in this time of the pandemic. So spirituality would be something that could help us. Something that not, I would say, not, not simply from an optional perspective, no, but it is a, an integral part of our being, integral part of our life. And if we forget spirituality, then we are actually forgetting an integral part of our life. And maybe that is why we might find uh, the situation a little more difficult 
And conversely, if we enter into our, examine our spiritual life a little more, then maybe that could help us in our well-being and preventing burnout. They say that there is strength in unity, strength in organization. The body itself has cells. Cells are organized into tissues, tissues into organs, organs into systems, the nervous system, muscular system, skeletal system, etc. But without the spirit, the body would just be a collection of organic chemicals. As we mentioned earlier, the difference between a body and a corpse, maybe a, a corpse that has recently died, maybe minutes ago or hours ago, maybe some of the functions would still be there, some of the chemical reactions, but it is quite different. The situation is quite different from a living body, from one who is still alive. And so without the spirit, the body is there, but it is just, maybe they have exactly the same skeletal structure, exactly the same muscles, exactly the same uh, blood cells. You could still ex extract the blood from that person who has just died. Uh, maybe they have exactly the same, but what this corpse is missing is this organizing factor. It is not, no longer, it is no longer organized so that its functions can no longer, uh, the, the functions are just remnants, no? whatever remains sort of an, a momentum, an inertia, uh, and, until it finally uh, collapses, until it finally decays. So bacteria would come in, etc. No? So without this organizing spirit, we again going back to our uh, first topic, no? the spirit of life that gives uh, spiritus the breath, breathing you know, is possible when the spirit is there. So this lump collection of organic chemicals would no longer have any life, would no longer have any organization, and therefore it would decay. And so again, the opposite you know, of being organized is decay. Decay is a lack of organization. We may be physically fit and mentally alert, but if we are weak in spirit, our body and mind would eventually also weaken. Hopefully not decay, <laughs> but they would, uh, they would weaken. Uh, they have no spirit. They have no inspiration. There is no breathing into our mind and our body. Yes, maybe we are strong. Maybe we are intelligent. We get the grade grades of one for example no? during our time we had so we had low grades always the professors were so strict no? but anyway even if we if we get high grades and we are strong we exercise a lot no we can run marathons etc but if our spiritual life is a little weak then maybe uh, sooner or later or maybe even now no? all those doubts all those difficulties all those uh, uh, manifestations of a lack of organization of our strong mind and our strong uh, body uh, but there's a lacking a component that is missing uh, the spiritual aspect then maybe we would not find meaning in what we are doing in our, our strong body it's like walking walking running but we don't know where we are going to so imagine, you, know, you just run, but without knowing where you are, nowhere. I remember once in uh, there was there was a couple you know, driving, and they were one they were quarreling a little. One is saying, "Oh, we have to turn left." No, turn right. You know? And then the husband said, "Wait, wait, wait. Well, wait, wait. Where are we going? Where are we going?" <laughs> so he forgot though know, where where they would be going. So. It's something like that. Ne? If we don't have the spirit called then, yes, we can drive, we can move the car, we can walk, we can run, but we don't know where we are going. And then later on, this couple, they said, oh, yeah, oh, okay, we're going to that place, we're going to that place, okay. 
So how do we go there? Turn left or right? They were still, they were still a little confused. And then suddenly one stopped and said, wait, wait. Yes, we are going there, but where are we now? <laughs> where are we now? They don't know where they were. So it's exactly the same thing. Right? If we, we can drive, but we don't know where we are now, where we came from, where we are going, then it's like having a, yes, a, a strong body, a, a mind that is quick, but lacking the spiritual part you know, that sort of organizes or take care, takes care of this, uh, our body, our mind. This spiritual part takes care also of the meaning. You know, the, the meaning gives us meaning in what we are doing. So we have to nurture the spirit. Each one has his or her circumstances, preferences, options, sets of prayers. Uh, some maybe would go to mass. You know, I remember during our time, uh, so many, many students and professors would go to mass even daily, uh, daily masses, because that would help us also reflect on our life and on what we are doing different spiritual exercises you know, that you might have learned maybe when you were young from your parents you know, or maybe on your own you have discovered so many things you know, even the bible if you want you could read the bible little by little you know, every day maybe five minutes you know, and then from beginning to end i would suggest reading the new testament first yes beginning to end of the new testament and then going to the old testament and that would be uh, easier no? and it would be a little more meaningful. Having a spiritual guide, a friend with whom we can speak regarding spiritual matters. So in the same way that we have a professor, we have a teacher, or we could discuss with our classmates regarding medical knowledge, exactly the same thing could happen when it comes to our spiritual life. Then we could have somebody we could share our experiences with, we could ask maybe, we could chat, no, we could exchange ideas, exchange notes regarding spiritual matters. And of course, to spend some time each day to reflect on our spiritual life, to reflect on what we are doing, lifting, lifting them up to God, asking God for help. The spiritual could also form part of the curriculum, of the medical curriculum, nursing curriculum, pharmacy, etc. Again, because it gives, it sort of completes the picture. The World Health Organization says that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. If we look at this definition, there is no spiritual in it. So, of course, I am a little sad. No? But I would say that we could go around this uh, definition and look at it from a different perspective. Yes, the term spiritual is not there. But we could say that, uh, reflecting a little more on what we have been discussing during this session, uh, yes, the physical could be there, the mental could be there, the social could be there. but it would be the spiritual uh, that keeps them together. Okay? So what gives unity to the physical, the mental, and the social? I would like to add, uh, this is a personal, personal reflection of mine, uh, that spirituality is what keeps the physical, mental, and social together. So if there is, again, going back, no, our body is strong, our mind is strong, our community is strong, but now we have to go beyond beyond these uh, angles and we have to see that it, it is the spiritual that would keep all this together health the term health itself no uh, also is related to holos holos means whole hologram no? uh, whole picture entire and it also it is also related to holy you know, holy again spiritual 
Okay? So holiness, health, wholeness, no? those terms come together. So we may ask who heals the healer? All of us are healers to a certain extent. Yes, bodily, but also even spiritually. I would say that all of us, we are all healers spiritually as well. We discover more meaning in what we do when we put in the spiritual aspects of our life, of our existence. We pray for ourselves, we pray for others, and we see what we could do for them. And I would say that this would be part of healing, of becoming whole, of becoming healthy, when we put the spiritual in our lives and in the lives of others. So our spirituality would also bring us to be concerned, not only of ourselves, but also of others. And this is, in, this is healing. Healing is trying to care for other people. So we can care for other people when we care for ourselves and this caring for ourselves holistically, not only our body, not only our mind, also our spirit, would lead us to care for others as well. You have more experience with patients and we know that they appreciate, we have, they appreciate when they know that their doctors not only cure them physically, but also pray for them. So I would suggest if you see patients who have maybe uh, tokens of devotion there, you know, maybe little, little prayer cards, uh, maybe that would be an opportunity for the healthcare worker, for the healer to accompany that person. And that way, he or she helps not only the patient, but also he herself or himself. Spirituality can direct our body and mind to the things that really matter for us. And this way we become whole, we become healthy, we are able to heal other people by healing ourselves as well. Alright, thank you so much uh, Father Gaston for that very inspirational talk, no? So it's, uh, it's great that you ended your talk by teaching us uh, how to become more spiritual when it comes to our practice of medicine, no, no matter what level we are. And uh, I am glad that you emphasize that we are all healers to a certain degree. No? So even med students as early as intermed, as early as LU3, no? we, can, we can practice being healers to other people so that we can instill uh, a bit of positivity uh, within everyone, no? within this, uh, this time of pandemic where negativity is all around us. All right, so to continue with our program, we'll be having a response from a student followed by a response from the faculty. So now I, I would like to call on former MSC President Leandro Salazar from Class 2022, who is also the founder of State Medical Schools Alliance, to give him res his response to Father Gaston talk. Okay, take it away, uh, Leandro. Thank you. Good afternoon, Father Gregory, Dean Charlotte, and to everyone. I would like to thank Father Gregory for this talk, and I would also like to thank the administration for not just hosting, but staying throughout this talk. It shows that you are not just there to organize, but to also listen and learn for the UPCM PGH community. Let me begin with a verse from the second book of St. James, verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. The pandemic has brought a lot of challenges, but it's not the same for everyone. I remember one set of posters I saw on Facebook showing how people have been during this pandemic. The crisis can be seen as a strong typhoon. We're all in the same ocean, but not in the same boat. Some are on yachts, some are on ships, some are on small wooden boats, some are on floaters, while the rest are drowning or have already drowned. We each face a different battle we may or may not have shared to others. And as individuals, we each have our own ways to cope. 
Purpose and meaning go beyond what is technical, Father Gregory said. Being a medical student is full of never-ending whys, especially now when everything seems to be so labile. It is during these moments when one finds oneself in a difficult position of whether to stop or carry on. But as I continue my journey, I remind, a reminder I tell myself is that the purpose and meaning of being a doctor goes beyond my personal dream of getting an MD. Being in this institution showed me that the purpose and meaning of being a doctor is to advocate for the welfare of our patients within and outside the halls of the hospital. Because just like when Father said that we should pray for others and see what we could do for them, my journey is not just about me anymore, but the Filipino community I hope to serve well. As an altar server serving at the PGH Chapel, my faith has been one of my sources of strength during these trying times. In this journey that appears to be filled with constant hardships and disappointments, I know that I am not alone. My spirit is assured that there is someone somewhere bigger than all of us in this universe, constantly guiding and caring for us. I hope that I can always say these words confidently because there are moments when I feel that these words aren't true. As someone who is languishing, a term coined by sociologist Corey Case to somehow describe people who weren't depressed but also weren't thriving, there are days when you just have to hold on to your rosary a little tighter and pray a little harder and hope that that someone listens. But in this country, with no clear end in sight and an incompetent government leading a subpar pandemic response, one cannot blame another for wishing to be in another place where life is valued and cared for. And this is when I feel that one spirit has tired out. The tiredness we are all experiencing is one way or another caused by the disservice of the state to the Filipino people. I came to realize further that whatever efforts we are doing can only do so much as to alleviate the difficulties. This can be visualized by looking at the current emergence of community pantries. It is a manifestation of a suffering community helping one another to survive. Bayanihan, as they call it, the Filipino mark of care and compassion for another. But in this scenario, it is not something that we should romanticize. It is only a band-aid solution for a persistent problem that is directly or indirectly ca causing our so-called burnout. If we look at it in terms of medicine, we're doing only temporary solutions. The definitive procedure is for the incompetent officials to resign and let the competent leaders lead. Leaders with transparency, consistency, and integrity. One's faith is the burning candle illuminating the cold cave of darkness. No matter how faint, its light gives warmth and comfort, helping anyone to get by. But this is not the only way. Again, there are more ways than one for people to cope with their struggles. And I believe that each and every way is valid, as long as you're not stepping on anyone else's rights or freedom. The important thing at present is that we keep trying to hold on and do our part in asserting for accountability from our leaders for the benefit not just of our community, but of the nation we are to serve. Because again, James 2 verse 26, as the body without spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Thank you and again, good afternoon. Right. Thank you, Leandro, for sharing your uh, message with us. So, yeah, I believe you'll always have confidence, no? Just the fact that you're uh, saying these things and sharing them with your students and to us, the faculty. Uh, we will all face this COVID pandemic together, no? And uh, speaking of faculty, I'd like to introduce our next uh, reactor, uh, Dr. Uh, Cecil Jimeno, who is the 
uh, who is the professor and chair of the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology and the clinical professor of the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Topher. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why, I'm, why I was asked to <clears throat> represent the faculty. Uh, probably because uh, maybe to say that the faculty also have their own share of uh, really stress and uh, a lack of wellness no, during this epidemic. And it's not even the first time actually that I've been asked to uh, react to Father Greg's message. And every time that I'm asked uh, to give a, a reaction, uh, I would say yes. No? And I'd like to echo and probably amplify some of the things that Father Greg said. And being a true endocrinologist, as I was preparing for this, for this uh, reaction, I was trying to, uh, to uh, read a little bit the Bible and uh, looked at some uh, words of inspiration. But what really, uh, ins what, the, what I'm really going to say today was actually taken from a Facebook message that I saw this morning. And it, it said, as a true endocrinologist, I'm going to talk about feeding. It said, be intentional about feeding your spirit. And Father Greg very strongly emphasized this. Our spirit is uh, as alive as our physical bodies. And therefore, we need to feed it. And so I'd like to very briefly talk about my journey and how I came to discover how to feed uh, my spirit uh, during this time of the pandemic or to nurture my spirit. Um, early on, uh, when the lockdown came on uh, March 15, and I remember it very well because we were supposed to have a flag ceremony. We were the sponsor, the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. And all of a sudden, there was a lockdown and it was a Monday, so we were not. And so I was filled, uh, uh, especially during those first few weeks, I was alternating between very, being very fearful about this virus, uh, about uh, what's going to happen with uh, how we're going to uh, teach the students. I was anxious. Uh, at the same time, I was angry about uh, some of the responses of the government. I was, um, but, but mainly the theme was I was quite fearful. And so I occasionally then gather with my friends online and we would talk or we would uh, have these conversations on Viber or on Facebook Messenger. We'd rant to each other and all that. And until it reached a point of desperation that uh, one or more, more of us just blurted out, uh, why don't we start praying together? And so that started that, that sense of community that uh, Father Greg talked about. These are my friends from med school. And uh, since med school until now, we've been in constant touch. But most of what we're doing are, are just things that friends would usually do, no? Uh, and uh, spending time together wasn't all about prayer. So that, that's how we began. We were all desperate uh, in, 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 inside of us. Our spirits were dying. And we felt that in order for us to uh, have peace, no? And to be able to then pray not only for each other, but for everything that was going on for the country. We then decided that we'll take a moment every day and just stop and pray with each other, even if we're in all, in all parts of the country. And so that started our 3 p.m. habit that we continued uh, uh, throughout the pandemic. And uh, we would begin by just... Uh, praying aloud no? in wherever we are, we would stop whatever it was that we, will do, we were doing and just then recite Psalm 21 and then go to Psalm 69 and then just then um, pray for all the different intentions and pray for what, what, uh, what we felt no? was weighing heavily in our hearts. And so that's the, uh, what I'd like to echo in what Father Greg said. Uh, when we nurture our spirit, we have to be intentional about it. And so uh, we intentionally stop at 3 p.m. and we'd pray if uh, uh, we would text each other or we'd message each other to tell each other it's 3 p.m. And so wherever we are, we would stop and we would pray. And that really gave us um, not only the peace uh, that we were so sorely lacking at the time, but 
really it strengthened us. It fed our spirit. And we continued to do that throughout the pandemic until we again went back to our old lives, our business, uh, all the things that we were uh, doing in uh, all of our professions. No? Uh, but because of that spiritual discipline that we had kept up for several months, each of us had evolved that into something that we each carried. And so for me uh, personally, it would be, uh, it would evolve so that every Friday I would stop at 12 and join my uh, church you know, uh, to pray and, in, uh, and intentionally um, really just lift up to the Lord everything that we uh, are feeling and everything that, uh, that is bothering us. You know? and, and, and so this pockets of time to pray, to reflect, this uh, spiritual discipline, um, really this intentionality uh, is uh, the one that nurtured uh, our spirits, not just me, but uh, actually uh, the friends that uh, I had been praying with. And so um, uh, this pandemic, you know, the silver lining for, for us, you know, for me, is it allowed us to nurture and feed my spirit. And, um, and this lesson, you know, I continue to actually keep so that when I started to plan, and uh, this is again in line with uh, what Father uh, Greg said about uh, our curriculum in medicine, not having uh, any much spirituality in it. So that when I started to plan for a module that I would uh, teach you know, along with the professors of endocrinology, I started to think about how also to help the students to nurture their own spirits, their own um, souls. Because I knew that everyone was feeling so discouraged by this time, uh, especially because uh, we each craved the interaction that we would have whenever we would do face-to-face uh, -face teaching. And so for the students, um, uh, it was really for me uh, a gift of inspiration from God uh, that um, we tried to incorporate uh, sometime uh, during the day-to-day -day, uh, lessons of the students, some lessons in wellness. And for that, you know, I did, we didn't really say, uh, tell them what to do. All that we did was to give them time uh, so that the first hour of every day uh, was actually a precious time that we, uh, that we told them. I, I thought that they were just going to have breakfast during that first hour. But when they started to then post uh, all the things that they did during the first hour, how they were nurturing their spirits, there were some who created music, uh, there were some who... Uh, who uh, made music on piano, their songs, their dances, all the things that they were doing with the time, with the gift of time that we gave them during our own module. In fact, it was I you know, who was nurtured in return with all of uh, these uh, creative activities that the students were doing. So again, I go back. Uh, Father Greg has uh, given us many wonderful uh, and beautiful uh, tips on how to nurture our spirit. But for us to do that, we have to be intentional. Uh, we really have to uh, find uh, uh, time, for example. And again, we have to uh, decide what is, what is it that is unique uh, for each of us. For me, it was really sitting down uh, to pray and to implore God and to read the Bible in order for me uh, to really uh, just have the, the peace in that desperation uh, and, and seek God more uh, closely. And so I end really for me, uh, this pandemic, uh, re the silver lining is uh, that because there was more time for me to spend um, uh, alone or more time for me to reflect, uh, because of the, uh, we don't have to spend so much time in traffic, for example. <laughs> the silver lining for me was really uh, that, that, that it has allowed me to uh, nurture and feed my spirit. And so I hope that's my prayer for each and every one of us, that um, we will 
we will be able to also uh, have that gift of uh, of being not only uh, being not being being able to not only nurture our own spirits but those of others through the prayers and the intentions that we make for them. So thank you very much, Father Greg, again, uh, for your words. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, thank you, Dr. Jimeno, for that very encouraging reaction. So thank you for sharing your journey throughout this pandemic. And thank you for being uh, concrete about it by giving concrete examples. No? It would be easier for the students and uh, Again, thank you for stressing the word intentional. So I think that's very true. Uh, even though uh, our spirituality or our religion is a part of our daily lives and defines who we are, I think, yes, we, uh, we should be intentional and really a lot of time to practice this and to uh, nourish our spirit. All right, so uh, for this uh, next segment, we shall now proceed with the question and answer. So for those who just entered, no, uh, feel free to uh, leave comments in the chat box or uh, raise your hand. But I think it's better to just leave questions in the chat box because I can only see a limited uh, number of participants in one screen at a time. No? And for those listening via uh, YouTube, you can also leave a question or a reaction in the chat box there. Right, so to start, let me just uh, first mention a message from our one of our Professor Emeritai. She's a Professor Emeritus in Psychiatry of the UP College of Medicine, Dr. Lourdes Ladrido Ignacio. She said that, uh, thank you very much, Father Gaston. Uh, I'd like to share that the Philippine Council for Mental Health in the Philippines has recently articulated a broad framework for understanding mental health in carrying out mental health pro policies and programs. And she mentions that this framework articulates a biological, psych psychological, social, and spiritual framework. So thank you, Dr. Ladrida Ignacio, for incorporating spirituality in your, uh, in your crusade to uh, take care of the mental health of our country. All right, so to start, let me first show uh, five questions we gathered from those who who filled out our Google Forms. So, uh, Father, we, uh, these are uh, the questions. So, number one, how can we cope with all our worries or anxieties during this pandemic? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much no, for the questions. And also, allow me to thank uh, Dr. Leandro Salazar and Dr. Uh, Ceci Limeno for their wonderful reflections on the meaning of life, use of the current situation, and also intentionality of our prayer life, of our spiritual life. Regarding coping with worries, well, uh, from the spiritual perspective, no, of course, we could always go into the psychological uh, perspective. No, I'm not an expert in that, but I heard that it would be good if we could share with somebody else. We could talk with somebody else, or we could even write down these uh, worries of ours. I have a friend, uh, she's a, a sleep, sleep doctor, no? also from UP, some batches ahead of us. And she said, because here we had a priest who couldn't, couldn't sleep. He couldn't sleep. He was sleeping maybe three hours every night for so long already. And he had some history of trauma in their country, civil war, and he had to take care as a young priest. He had to be with the bishop all the time. And then at some point, he was in charge of feeding 80,000 people, 80,000 people displaced by the war every day. Every day, so imagine where will you get all those resources in a poor country with all the wars going on, etc. So now he couldn't sleep. So what the doctor suggested was, of course, finding a sleep doctor is a bit difficult. But she said that even more effective than medication, and then having the sleeping pills, etc. More effective is to simply spend 15, 30 minutes every afternoon when one is uh, a little more peaceful, a little quiet, some make, create, find some time, invent some time, 15, 30 minutes to write down three columns, three columns. So first column is 
what are the things that worry you that you keep thinking about at night? Okay, so things that you remember just before bedtime, so you end up not sleeping. So you list down those items, those thoughts or those concerns, those problems, or maybe even positive news, maybe that could be, excite us too much. No? So, and then second column to write down the possible solutions to these problems, if any, okay, write them down. Third column, in case there are no solutions after all, then also write down that there is no solution and so far no solution and then leave everything up to God. And so psychology and spirituality could meet somewhere leave everything up to God, divine providence, abandonment to divine providence. We do not always understand God's thoughts because he is God and we are just simple human beings, but we can be assured that God knows best. God knows best. And from evil, as St. Paul would say, God can bring out abundance and abundance of good. And we also, whenever we see some evil, we could also try to pour some good into it, overwhelm even with good, so that we could also help other people. But coping with worries, on the one hand is, yes, taking good care of ourselves, but sometimes also, maybe for some, no, this, could, this could happen, focusing on other people, on the worries of other people. Maybe they have more problems than us. Maybe they have more difficulties than us. Of course, it depends also, also on these problems, on these worries no, that we have. If they are just small and we see that maybe, uh, objectively speaking, these worries are not really worth it, then maybe if we focus on the worries of other people, we could forget about our little worries and we could elevate this to the spiritual level as well. No? Our love, charity, uh, reaching out to others, helping others, dying unto ourselves so that others could live just like Jesus Christ, just what we have reflected upon during Lent and Easter. You know, we die unto ourselves with Jesus so that others might live. But if our difficulties are objectively great, and it is not, we cannot simply set them aside, then yes, we could reflect upon them and we could look for solutions. But another thing that could help most likely is to consult with others, confer with others, maybe exchange notes with others. Just like if we have medical problems, we go to a doctor, then maybe if we have personal concerns, we could go to maybe our brother, our sister, members of our family, or maybe to a good friend, a friend who would, who would understand us. And we could share this with those persons. And sometimes, you know, my experience, you know, because sometimes people would come to me as well to consult, I just listen, Sometimes I don't say practically anything. I just listen, listen, listen. And then this person tells me, oh, Father, thank you so much. You have helped me so much. <laughs> and what, what did I say? Maybe one sentence, two sentences. But the fact that I was listening to that person, that helped him or her a lot. So in the same way, we also, I also go to my spiritual director. I also go to my confessor. So all of us, oh, we could be helped not cope to cope with our difficulties, with our worries, if we could share them with others. Maybe the fact that we talk about this, we already find solutions by ourselves. Or maybe that other person could help us by giving us some suggestions. So thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Father, for this very comprehensive answer. So just to recap, no, uh, to answer that question, you, you can write write down no, our uh, concerns no, into three columns. So the first column would uh, include our worries, thoughts, even something positive that keeps us at night. And then on the second column, the possible solutions. No? If there are no solutions, you can write that on the third column and leave it all to God. And another thing is focusing on others, which uh, I believe is very true. No? Sometimes, you know, if we think about others, no? the other people suffering in society, in the country, no? sometimes you can see that our problems are very small compared to others. And uh, leaning on, on uh, others, no? if you find a support system, and sometimes we can be a support system uh, for others, as Father said, no? just listening can uh, go a long way. Right, so for the next question, let's take another. Uh, yes. I'd like to add no, that uh, this priest doing those three columns he is now able to sleep seven hours, seven and a half hmm. hours, 
<laughs> and he had to recover all his lost sleep before. Good. Oh, at least uh, mabuti na po siya ngayon. Right, so uh, let's ano naman, take a question from the chat box. No? So the question is, Father, uh, how do we deal with sadness? Do we try to smile through it and not show our sadness so as not to make people around us uncomfortable? So yun po, that's the next question. Okay, so thank you so much. No? Sadness as an emotion. The opposite would be joy. No? Uh, as St. Francis would also in his prayer, no? where there is uh, uh, sadness, joy. No? Grant me sadness when, where there is joy. And sadness, these emotions, I think any emotion for that matter, is affected a lot by our views about things, about our own values, about our reactions, you know, how we would uh, look at the other person, for example. So I think this would, uh, changing from sadness to joy would also depend a lot on inside of us. But yes, we are affected by outside, you know, what is happening outside. And as the one who asked also mentioned you know, that uh, showing our sadness to others might also cause sadness in others. Uh, I'm, I now remember one of our lessons in communication. Uh, actually, I'm doing an online course in UP Open University on communication. And one of our lessons uh, said that communication does not only convey reality, but even creates reality. So communication does not only convey, not tells us what is going on outside, but even creates reality inside of us. So if we, I hear a good news, that would make me happy. But if it's bad news, it would create the reality of sadness inside of me. Okay? So uh, what we get from uh, outside, what is communicated to us, would also change the reality of ourselves. Not only our view of reality outside of us, but our own reality inside no, could, could be changed. No, could, there could be uh, a sadness created in us, for example, by bad news. So maybe I would go into these two, two angles. No? From the outside, if we are always sad, then maybe it would be best to avoid bad news, sad news. No? The, even news as a whole in the television, in, in uh, radio, internet, etc. Of course, we know that all these are are well they have some the, the money angle behind it <laughs> so they will not write if they don't want to earn money from advertisements they would not uh, give a, a news that would not really excite the people and cause the people to watch uh, so people have to be excited have to be uh, induced to watch those uh, news articles and therefore they would often focus on the bad news as they say, good news is no news. Also, no? like old news is no news. Good news sometimes no, is no news at all. So we have heard of people being killed, people being, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, drugs and all this. But we don't hear about a kind act that somebody has done towards another person. And we could not, hospitals, for example, no? we can hear about deaths, COVID cases, etc. Once in a while, thanks be to God, we also hear about heroic acts of doctors, healthcare personnel, but I think they have to be highlighted a little more. Or even the COVID cases, no? uh, we hear a lot about the bad news, but maybe we could also highlight the good news of people getting well, of new, new discoveries and all this. So from the outside, we could be helped by this uh, information that would create uh, reality inside of us, joy, hopefully, and maybe from the inside also, again, going back to prayer, uh, as Dr. Uh, Cecil uh, emphasized, uh, intentionally nurturing, nurturing our spirit. It's like food. So it's not that we just take it for granted. We have our little schedules for eating breakfast, lunch, dinner, maybe snacks in between. So spiritual life would also be similar. Now, intentionally, it would be best if we could make our little list of prayers. A little in the morning, a little at noon, in the afternoon, maybe drop by the chapel, 
if we, uh, we're going to another department, another place, and then the chaplain is there, maybe spend half minute or one minute or 30 minutes, depends on each one of us. Yeah, so intentionally. So coping with sadness means to create you know, the, the reality within us, but with the help of outside uh, factors, inside reflection, and again, as always, you know, conferring with other people. And that way, just like the worries that, that we have, if we compare with other people's worries and maybe sadness as well, then that could help alleviate our own if we try to help other people in their own experiences as well. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Father, for answering that question. So due to the inter uh, interest of time, no, we'll uh, just uh, be asking two more questions. So for the next question, I'll be taking again from the from the Google form. So basically, I'll just merge uh, two questions now into one. So the question is, how do we keep our faith alive and how do we regain the feeling of having a purpose in life during the pandemic? Okay. Oh, thank you so much. No? Very interesting questions. Uh, faith is something that we could also nurture. No? Faith in theology, we... we, we Sometimes we confuse faith and hope. I have faith in God. I have, I have hope in God. I trust in God. <laughs> Technically, at least when we study theology, faith is a little more towards knowledge. You know, I have faith in God. I have knowledge. Knowledge of God. I get to know God. And knowing God means communicating with him, means praying with him, means uh, having this relationship with him. And faith is... In not only knowing something, but having a relationship with the person who gives us, us that knowledge. So unlike, for example, a news reporter whom we see on the television who tells us that, oh, Mayon volcano, it, it did not recently, I hope, no, but in the past, Mayon volcano exploded. Yes, erupted. Yes, there was an eruption. And we know that there was an eruption. But we don't know who this reporter is. Maybe he or she is famous, we know a little, but we don't have a relationship with that reporter. On the other hand, when it comes to faith, yes, we know that God exists, we know that God created the world, we know that God loves us, but we have to get to know God a little more and enter into a relationship with him. So it is not enough to know him, but we don't pray, <laughs> we don't communicate with him, we don't listen to him, we just know him as a textbook item. So uh, maybe increasing our faith uh, in the midst of this pandemic, uh, this would be the, the way you know, to, again, intentionally uh, spend some time in our faith and to uh, spend some time in our prayer life, con conferring with other people whom we see pray, whom we see are happy, you know, we associate with them. We try to learn from them, maybe informally, indirectly, you know, noticing what they do, how they do things, you know, their optimism. And that way we could also uh, improve you know, in our own uh, coping with worries, with sadness, keeping our faith alive and setting our little goals in, in prayer life each day. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Father. So for the last question, this actually came from a student, no? So her question is, how do you know if a patient is open to spiritual things or praying for them? A fear of mine is that maybe they might be offended. Ah, okay. I would say, I would always insist uh, that when it comes to spiritual matters with patients, the thing is to, to observe. Observe first, no? even in my, my personal opinion, no? even in Catholic hospitals, we should always ask the patient first or observe the patient first. So sometimes it is obvious if the patient has a crucifix or the patient has a Bible, a patient has a novena, prayer, something religious, religious item at the bedside or the patient holds those uh, little tokens of their devotion, then we are sure that the patient is religious and would like to pray. And so we could offer we could offer and i think the impact you know, that doctors will be making on the patient spiritually is really great that's really great not only that the priest of course the priest will drop by the chaplain will drop by and the patient expects the chaplain to pray 
No, but seeing a priest trying to cure the patient, not only physically but also spiritually, I think that's even a double double effect, no? and the patient would really appreciate would really appreciate. But some patients maybe they don't want to pray. Then okay, no, don't don't worry, don't worry. But if you are in doubt, maybe if you see that it is appropriate, you could ask the watcher, the relative beside the patient. Well, maybe would the patient want to pray or not? If the relative says no, 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 okay, <laughs> there's no need to insist. No, but also not to object. And not to object. As uh, now talking as a hospital policy, for example, no? not not to object to the spiritual aspect. No? And this is very easy in the Philippines because we Filipinos we are naturally religious, at least most of us. But in other countries, no, all these laws, even even anti-christian laws no? and there are so many places where we are we are being persecuted no? and it never comes out in the news no people christians being killed for just being christians no? so, and of course policies government policies etc anyway not to not to force people but also not to deny them no? this healing touch this wonderful uh passage of grace and that way we become God's instruments of his love of his joy of his peace if praying with a patient very short not 13 seconds maybe or just telling the praise the patient okay I will pray for you in the mass I will pray for you uh, today in my prayers and that would give life uh, to the patient and the patients hopefully would not be denied of this beautiful opportunity of this beautiful uh, grace from the doctors, from the nurses, from the healthcare workers. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you, Father Gaston, for uh, answering all of our questions. And thank you so much for uh, sharing your time with us and giving us very insightful and uh, inspirational talks no? so that we could find uh, any ounce of positivity during this uh, really difficult time of the pandemic. So uh, to wrap up our very first uh, wellness webinar, uh, may I call on Dr. Maria Lisa Antonet Gonzalez, the Associate Dean for Faculty and Students. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you, Father Gregory, for your enlightening talk. And thank you to our reactors, Leandro and uh, Cecil Jimeno, for sharing your personal experiences and your reflections with, with us. Also, I would like to say thank you to our faculty, our students, um, and our admin staff who are here, who have participated by asking their questions. So the title of this talk is a wake-up call for me, and maybe for many of us. Um, when Dean Charlotte started her term, uh, that was three years ago, her request from our office, which is the Office for Faculty and Students, is to create a committee that will provide a nurturing environment in the college. So one that will promote and develop positive mental health in students and create a learning environment that will be conducive to maximum learning. This afternoon, Father Gregory reminded me that nurturing the body and mind is important, but it is only one aspect and that nurturing the spirit is just as important. After all, as the Bible would tell us, we are not merely physical or earthly beings, we are spiritual beings. And to me, that has always been a source of great comfort and assurance. It is what makes me strive to be better, calmer, kinder, and stronger version of myself. The spirit is the aspect of ourselves that can carry us and enable us to experience a sense of peace and purpose even when life deals us a severe blow. A strong spirit helps us to survive and thrive with grace even in the face of difficulty. Spiritual wellness cannot, cannot be accomplished overnight or by attending one webinar or even a series of webinars such as this. Finding meaning and purpose is a lifelong process that evolves based on unique circumstances, individual experiences, and even global events. Also, finding our purpose, I believe, is one personal journey 
that all individuals who seek wholeness need to go through. In times of great adversity and uncertainty, such as what we are all facing now, it is good to know that we can call on a greater power, a greater being, to help us make our decisions and choices easier, ground us during periods of change, and give us the resiliency to survive with grace and inner peace in the face of adversity. Having a spiritual element in our lives may even help us heal when suffering from a physical or mental condition. Father Gregory reminds us that we are not alone in our journey as we seek wholeness. We have our families, our friends, and colleagues. And for our students here, you have your classmates, your teachers, your advisors, your mentors, and even the faculty and administrators in the college. Even this is a blessing. And even this, I believe, is a sign that there is a greater, more powerful being who is looking out for us and who considers each of us precious and beloved. And so I end this webinar with a grateful heart and a joyful spirit. I pray that your bodies, minds, and spirits continue to be nourished as we continue our journey to find our purpose and meaning, even or especially during these challenging times. Good afternoon, everyone, and may God bless each and every one of you. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, for that very encouraging uh, closing remarks and uh, for wishing us well. No, So, uh, again, for... Thank you so much, Father Gaston, uh, Dean Charlotte, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, Dr. Henmino, Dr. Uh, Uson, everyone who helped in organizing this uh, very first wellness uh, webinar. No? So as the wellness committee, I uh, would like to invite you to suggest anything that you would like to be talked about. No? So we are here really for the students uh, to help you cope with uh, this pandemic. No? that uh, has been afflicting everyone. So uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to end this uh, webinar by telling everyone to stay safe and uh, we are all looking forward to seeing everyone face-to-face -face again. Uh, so good afternoon and thank you everyone.